Hello, I am Greg Crawford, president of Miami University. I am honored to introduce the speaker for today's Juneteenth lecture. Juneteenth commemorates an important time in our history, the end of slavery in the United States. To honor and celebrate Juneteenth and its importance to our culture of inclusive excellence and racial equality, Miami University's Office of Diversity and Inclusion presents this Juneteenth teach-in featuring Professor Rodney Coates. Professor Coates is a renowned public sociologist who is engaged in race, justice, social movements, social policy, and practice. He is a dynamic scholar and public intellectual who has been featured on national platforms. He has developed and taught a variety of courses that appeal to the human consciousness and inform societal change. His course on globalization, justice, and human rights, which links universities from around the world, has received numerous accolades and been featured in several publications. Professor Coates is an award-winning scholar who has charted new territory. His record of scholarship spans three decades and includes numerous published, peer-reviewed articles, books, book chapters, and collections. It is an honor to have a scholar such as Professor Coates as part of the Miami University family. Thank you for tuning in. Please enjoy the lecture. Love and honor. In one day, we shall celebrate yet another Juneteenth here in America, a celebration of what many consider the final end of slavery to blacks in this country. This celebration coming two and a half years after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation was accomplished as federal troops arrived in Galveston, Texas in 1865. But as with all historical events, this one is filled with ironies and paradoxes, hopes dashed and dreams unfulfilled. This event to many represent the duplicity of power, the cruelty of complacency, and the willingness of many to forestall, deny, and ignore the plight of the slave. Consequently, as I will argue in this talk, the so-called freedom of the slave was a check that continually has come back marked insufficient funds. They were offered the premise of a promise yet unfulfilled. Let me begin. The first question that comes up is why it took a full two and a half years for the news of freedom to come to Texas. Some argue that it was deliberately delayed in an effort to placate angry slaveholders still in denial. Others argue that the federal troops themselves delayed the order so as to give the slave owners one last chance to get the cotton harvest in. But then we must also understand that the war, our bloodiest ever fought, had nothing to do with slavery and everything to do with power. The slave was just another pawn in this political gambit as the leaders of our nation, both North and South, battled to see whose version of America would prevail, one controlled by the Northern industrial elite and the other controlled by Southern plantation elite. There was really no concern of whether or not the slave would be free as acknowledged by Abraham Lincoln as he declared what shall we do with the slave. My first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them to Liberia, to their own native land, but a moment's reflection would convince me that whatever of high hopes, as I think there is, there may be in this. In the long run, its sudden execution is impossible. If they were all landed there in one day, they would all perish in the next 10 days, and there are not surplus shipping and surplus money enough in the world to carry them there. In many times, 10 days, what then? Free them all and keep them among us as underlings? Is it quite certain? that this better their condition, I think I would not hold one in slavery at any rate, yet the point is not clear enough for me to denounce people upon. What next? Free them and make them politically and socially our equals? My own feelings will not admit of this. And if mine would, we will know that those of the great mass of white people will not. Lincoln did what was expedient. 
in an effort to force the rebellious slaveholding states back into the Union. He freed those slaves only in the states in rebellion. That is, he freed those slaves he had no control over. No slaves were freed from those slaves, states loyal to the Union and not in rebellion. And so the Emancipation Proclamation held out a premise of a promise of freedom, a premise that never came to pass as the great mass of white people refused to allow it to come into being. The premise that all men, all humans are created equal and endowed by their created with certain inalienable rights, the least of these rights being the of life, of liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which constituted the premise that the Emancipation Proclamation promise would go unfulfilled. A check written and returned marked insufficient funds, and it is the this check that constitutes the paradox of American justice that yet goes unfulfilled. But how did we get to this American paradox? The Civil War ended on April 9, 1965, as Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate troops to General Ulysses S. Grant at the Appomattox Courthouse in Virginia thus ending the costliest domestic wars America has ever fought as an estimated 1.56 million Union and 800,000 Confederate forces battle for supremacy. And at the close of the war, some 4 million blacks constituting 88% of all blacks were now free. But there were another 250,000 in Texas that languished in slavery. Neither Lincoln nor Washington had any real impact upon Texas, primarily because there were not enough Union troops there to enforce the order. Such force was not available until after the surrender of General Lee on April of 1865 and the arrival of General Granger's regiment two months later. Listen as Granger declares their freedom in his general order number three. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection here to four existing between them becomes that between employer and hired laborer. The freedmen are advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages. They inform that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness either there or elsewhere. I cannot help but wonder if any whites were advised to remain quietly at their present homes and work for wages and that they will not be supported in their idleness either there or elsewhere. Never in the history of this country was such a restriction or expectation placed on whites. As we will see later, these were the seeds through which the infamous Jim Crow codes and laws would ensue. But for now, let us consider the responses of the former slaves. The responses of the former slaves range from both shock and exaltation, from acts of retribution to praise, from praying and celebration to cries of despair and loss. Some left not only the plantation but the south, seeking to reestablish connections with family and communities broken and shattered as a consequence of slavery. Others stayed to attempt to take on this thing called freedom in the very place they were slaves. Regardless, these slaves challenged America to recognize their equality as they sought to establish themselves as free people within America. Ironically, one of the first things these free people sought to do was to embrace education. It should be recalled that under slavery, it was illegal in many states to teach any blacks either free or enslaved reading and writing, but even under slavery, blacks facing severe punishment still found ways to support and encourage education. Therefore, it is not strange that after the war and emancipation, the now freedmen gathered in homes and cellars and sheds and meeting houses and even under the shade of trees on the fields where they worked the crops to learn. 
They learn from each other, teachers, their own clergy, or older family members. They not only learn to read and write, but they learn their history as a people. Imagine the scene recorded from South Carolina as a six-year-old girl sits beside her mother, her grandmother, and her great-grandmother, over 75 years old, all embracing learning and reading for the first time. And from the beginning, many of the freedmen distrusted the scallywags and the carpetbaggers and the farmer masters, demanded to learn to read for themselves, to learn math, to read the Bible firsthand. And they therefore established their own schools, freedom schools to accomplish this. These freedom schools were sometimes funded by white aid and benevolent societies from the North, such as the American Missionary Association and National Freedmen's Relief Association, Sabbath schools, night schools. But the majority of these monies to fund these schools came from the newly freed Americans themselves as they privately sponsored their own schools. One such example of these church schools is found in Sharpsburg, Maryland, and a small church known as Tolson's Chapel. Tolson's Chapel built by blacks just two years after the end of slavery in 1864. And for over 30 years, from 1868 to 1899, this one-room building was both church and school located near the site of the Civil War battle of Antietam. The history of the schools housed in Tolson's Chapel illustrates how African Americans ac across the former slave owning states created and sustained schools during Reconstruction. Here, the dreams of freedom was born as local blacks sought to educate themselves and their children. Consequently, as African Americans established their own schools and advocated public education, they claimed education as a basic right of citizens. This dedication on the part of the former slave to educate laid the foundation of publicly funded schools for both blacks and whites throughout the South and border states. Along with the right to education, these newly freed Americans sought to become economically independent and exercise their full civil and political rights. One of the most significant outcomes of these efforts were the establishment of all black towns across America. These freedmen towns or all black towns were established by and for a predominantly African American population. Many were actually established by the freed slaves and existed in many of the former southern states. For example, Oklahoma, prior to the end of segregation, boasted dozens of these communities. While in Texas, some 357 freedom colonies have been verified and located. And therefore, for a brief period, the promise of freedom flourished as Congress passed, then slowly the states ratified the so-called Reconstruction Amendments. These three amendments, the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th abolished slavery and attempted to guarantee equal protection of the laws and the rights to vote. So for a brief moment, there was the illusion of freedom as the 13th Amendment prohibited involuntary servitude. And the principles of citizenship was ratified with the 14th Amendment for all those born or naturalized and guaranteed the rights to vote and decide who could hold office. And these rights were again reinforced in the 14th Amendment that established that these rights of full citizenship could not be abridged through due to race, color, or previous conditions of servitude. Of interest is that all debts of those that were associated with either the insurrection or rebellion against the United States and even the claim for the loss of emancipation of any slaves were considered non-enforceable. And all claims shall be held, it argued, illegal and void. Even from the start, the problems were apparent as women for the first time within the U.S. Constitution were denied the right to vote. Unfortunately, these amendments did not provide any enforcement provisions, nor did they preclude the former states or its members from 
seeking to nullify, negate, or circumvent these laws. No sooner than these amendments were ratified and after the assassination of Lincoln, state laws and federal court decisions began to erode and nullify much of these throughout the late 18th century. Many states passed what would be known as Jim Crow laws that limited the rights of African Americans and decisions made by the Supreme Court, such as the slaughterhouse cases of 1873, undermined and prevented several guaranteed rights and made them unenforceable by holding that these privileges or immunities could not be extended to the rights under state law. And then Plessy versus Ferguson, a case in 1896, was established separate but equal and gave federal approval to all the Jim Crow laws. It would be 1953 and the High Court's decision of Brown versus Board of Education of 54 and the Civil Rights Act of 64 and the Voting Rights Act of 65 before these rights would be restored. The responses of Southern whites to the newly freed slaves were not limited to legislation or court actions. As the American blacks celebrated their new freedom, many whites in the South mourned the passage of what they believed was their greatness. For many Southern whites, this was personal and represented a communal defeat, making the demise of the white man and a time of dismay. They mourned the loss of traditions and customs, families and properties, and a whole way of life built with the blood, sacrifices, and lives of blacks. Many considered leaving while others began to retreat into nostalgia and fictitious memories of the Old South and mourning the lost cause of the Confederacy. And the first Confederate Memorial Association began appearing as early as 1865 and 66 as they built cemeteries and monuments throughout the South. Others created groups such as the Ku Klux Klan, which resorted to violence and murder and terror to oppose this new freedom. The story of Tulsa and Black Wall Street and hundreds of other black colonies illustrate the terror that ensued as, America, as Africans sought to create their freedom. No sooner than the 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment were enacted, which provide legal and civil protection to former slaves, members of the Ku Klux Klan began systematic terrorist attacks against black citizens for exercising their rights to vote, running for office, or serving on juries. The Congress was quick to respond by passing a series of enforcement acts of 1870 71, which attempted to end such violence and empower the president to use even military force to protect African Americans. The Act of 1870, for example, even prohibited groups of people from banding together or to go in disguise upon public highways and upon the premises of another with the intention of violating another's constitutional rights. Legislative intent aside, these acts did nothing to diminish the harassment of black voters across the South. And seeing the lack of enforcement, the Senate passed two more force acts, one known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, were designated to enforce the 14th Amendment of the Civil Rights Act of 1866. A second force act passed in 1871 aimed to place national elections under the control of the federal government and empower federal judges and U.S. Marshals to supervise local elections. Then the Third Force Act of April of 1870 gave the president the power to use armed forces to combat those who conspired to deny equal protection of the law and to suspend habeas corpus when necessary to enforce the act. These acts provided temporary assistance in ending the violence and intimidation, but the formal end of Reconstruction in 1877 opened the floodgates for the disenfranchisement and violence targeting African Americans. Absent these protections, the issuance of Jim Crow laws throughout the South, it was essentially open season on blacks. Lynching became the most frequent weapon of terror 
uh, to terrorize blacks and force them into submission by 1877, lynching were so normalized they were flagrantly committed as public displays. People would dress up, invite friends and neighbors, even take out advertisements in local newspapers. Large crowds, whole families would show up to watch blacks get their justice. All too often, blacks were punished for being prominent, for being free or being successful. Many whites, rich and poor, used these to keep blacks in their place. Often the myth of the black man as sexual predator was used to fire up the masses. And all too often the real insult was the fact that African Americans were perceived as being political and economic threats, not sexual predators who wanted to foster integration in order to assault innocent white women. Lynching and white riots were used to teach them a lesson, put them in their place, and serve as a warning to any other blacks arrogant enough to challenge white supremacy. From the late 19th century to the middle of the 20th century, close to 5,000 blacks were lynched. In Mississippi alone, some 500 were lynched from 1800 to 1955. Lynchings, however, was not restricted to the South as over 35 people died right here in Ohio from 1892 to 1932. Few were innocent as a full range of whites from journalists to legislators, from police to judges, from labor leaders to clergy were anything but innocent bystanders. But blacks were not content to sit and be lynched as Blacks voted with their feet and initiated the largest domestic migration movement in modern history as millions of blacks relocated from the most violent southern regions to what was presumed to be a more tolerant north. But the white mob was not content to lynch single individuals. Soon whole towns became annihilated. Over the last couple of weeks, America has become absorbed and shocked by the massacres that took place in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. But we should point out that Tulsa was just one of at least 50 separate events where African Americans were violently expelled from their homes, towns, cities, and counties within the United States. For the majority of these occurring, from just after the Civil War and lasting up until 1954. To date, few have been brought to trial, even though photos by the tens of thousands can be found throughout the internet. Never has domestic terrorism, public murders, and riots been so celebrated. And of course, even as lynching and whole-scale black massacres began to wane, the black church continues to this day to be a central target of America's racial angst. And herein lies an irony. During the whole of the 19th century, only one church, the Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, was burned down in 1822. Over the next few decades and into the 20th century, an average of six churches were burned each decade. Then we hit the end of the 20th century where over 30 black churches were burned in just an 18 month period of time, from 1995 to 1996. Congress finally passed the 66 Church Arson Prevention Act and Clinton established a presidential commission to document the burning of black churches. They documented as many as 820 churches might have been burned, but the spate of church burnings has not ended. From then to 2018, another 16 churches were burned. And so far this year alone, seven black churches have been burned. These attacks were aimed at the spiritual core of the African American community. They aimed to kill that spirit, but what they did was to fire up the community. Resounding calls could be heard as blacks said, hell no, we ain't gonna run. And what of the cost of all of this violence? 
for the period of slavery to the United, in the United States, that is, if the slave had been reimbursed for their time and for servitude, it is estimated to range from 8.6 trillion to 6.2 quadrillion, compounded annually with three to six percent, and for the loss of land and property, another 35 trillion to 16 quadrillion. Finally, no one has estimated the cost of pain and suffering over these 400 years, but again, it would be in the quadrillions. This has been the cost of white violence perpetrated against blacks. And where do we go from here? I would argue that we start with a new promise and articulate a new set of premises. Even as I write this, I'm aware of the triple threats that currently face blacks. These threats, curtailment and suppression of voting, police racially motivated violence and attacks on black churches, and attempts to shut down critical race theory. As we examine these threats, we recognize that they are not isolated, but represent a systemic attack upon the black community across America. And throughout American history, whenever the nation has been confronted with an existential threat, it has resulted in the targeting of racial groups, particularly blacks. This targeting has taken multiple forms, individual attacks to mob violence, from lynching to massacres, but of late, these have been institutionalized as the state has become the instrument of violence. Hence, we note the mass incarceration of black, particularly black men, and the war on drugs. We note the militarization of the police and the over of our neighborhoods. We note the harsher sentencing and racialized use of the death penalty. We note the increasing likelihood of black children being expelled from schools, our, our churches bombed, and our livelihoods continually threaten. These continual assaults have resulted in increased psychological trauma, mental health, and life expectancies. Blacks, however, have not responded as victims, but as victors as each generation has fought to regain that which was lost. Reignite the fire of freedom and walk with dignity, head held high. As we celebrate Another June 10th, it is this spirit of victory that we celebrate even as we acknowledge the tragedies and con that continually confront us. The current attack on voters' rights has a long and torturous history dating back to 1865. We have been down this road before. Where in the name of freedom and democracy, many states with heavy black voters developed a systemic number of checks aimed at restoring our faith in voting. Strange. On the surface, none of these are races. In fact, all of them made sense until they were applied. And that application, not particularly the laws, resulted in the wholesale suppression of the black vote, a suppression that's lasted some 100 years from the Voters' Rights Act of 1865 to the Voters' Rights Act of 1965. And here we are again. States across America are debating and passing legislation that aims to install the 1776 project and reject the 1619 project. The argument that critical race theory is a kind of racial attack on whites is both absurd and dangerous. Critical race theory does not blame current day whites for what happened in the past, but it does point out the pain that is currently been delivered by that past. It challenges much of our historical accounts that belie historical realities. It helps balance the scales by telling all of the stories of our past, not just one that makes us feel comfortable. It tells these stories from the vantage point of those that were victimized. Imagine the story of rape or incest or any other crime. Now imagine that we only hear the side of the rapist or the perpetrator and not the victims. Critical race theory recognizes that the more sides of the stories we tell, the more balanced the histories will be. And finally, the problem with police violence is not a problem with police, but with police systems. That is to say, 
policing has been militarized to the point where our guardians have become warriors. As a consequence, police go to war on a daily basis. As a Vietnam veteran, I can only imagine what it's like to be involved in a never-ending war, a war where there are no clear lines between us and them, between combatant and defender. Perhaps it's time that we declare a truce, a ceasefire, and rethink the purpose of policing. In the process, we might decide that the problem is not policing courts, but our schools and training. The issue is not bad kids, but bad opportunities. Let's help to create hope and better opportunities by increasing the success rates of our schools and life chances. We might just see that we need less police and in those situations where we do need police, maybe they need to be accompanied by drug and family counselors, social workers and psychologists. Dealing with these threats will define the current struggle for justice and equality originally promised on June 10th. And we have a long history of dealing with existential threats and sustaining our struggle for justice and equality here. Let us remember that struggle and the reality of our self-declared freedom. In 1775, English scholar Samuel Johnson wrote, how is it that we hear the loudest yelps for liberty among the Negroes? The first anti-slavery societies were founded in the same year that the Declaration of Independence was penned, and while some debated the compensation that slave owners should receive, many argued for the slave to be compensated. William Lloyd Garrison, when asked about the emancipation of slave, remarked that emancipation was not enough. We must be free from the caprice of men's cruelty to man. Frederick Douglass argued that the Negro must own their selves and their futures. They must have universal equal rights and liberty. Angela Grimke in 1837 letter remarked that the freedom of blacks was a human and moral right that could not be denied. Black history is American history. Black liberation is the essence of American liberation. And until all realize the promises of the Declaration of Independence, of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, none will experience these promises. Although victimized repeatedly and horribly, we have not succumbed to being victims. We have and continue to be overcomers. We have rebuilt that which has been destroyed, relocated where we have not been wanted. What we have not done is abandon our quest to breathe free. Nor have we failed to achieve in every field of human endeavor. We have served in every war since the Revolutionary War with valor and distinction. We have built and continue to rebuild our homes, our communities, and our lives. And what are these accomplishments? Under duress, Matthew Henson, along with Admiral Robert Perry, explored the North Pole in 1909. Jesse Owens demonstrated to Hitler what a black man can do by winning four gold medals in the Berlin Olympics of 36. Jackie Robinson became the first black to enter the major leagues, and even while blacks had been playing the sport for over 60 years. We have Aletha Gibson, v Venus Williams, Coco, Guff, and Naomi Osaka, who just might be the best tennis player in the world. We have Gwendolyn Brooks with pen and prose, who won the Pulitzer Prize for poetry in 1950, and we have this amazing young poet, Amanda Garman, the youngest inaugural poet of U.S. history, an award-winning writer, cum laude graduate of Harvard, who shows what the future looks like. We have Barack Obama, who became the first black president of the United States, and Kamala Harris, the first black female vice president of the United States. African-American innovation impacts upon all aspects of our lives. We eat potato chips that first created by uh, George Croom in 1853. Many of us have played with the super soaker invented by NASA scientist Lonnie Johnson. Mobile communication owns their beginning to the 1887 invention of the telegraph by Granville T. Woods. In 
open heart surgery pioneered by Daniel Hale Williams in uh, 1893 has saved millions of lives of those saved by Charles Drew and his invention of a technique to preserve blood plasma. And even now, we're witnessing the miracle of a COVID vaccine, thanks in part to the work done by Dr. Kazmika Colbert. We do not wait nor expect freedom to come from legislation or judicial decrees. We are free by virtue of being humans. And as we enjoy yet another Juneteenth, we shall continue to persevere, serve, invent, and excel. We, by any means necessary, will not only continue to survive, but we will thrive and set new standards of achievement. It is more than our right, it is our mandate from the creator of all. We will settle for nothing less than full accountability and responsibility for past wrongs. And while we recognize that reparations are due, we have no confidence that any will come anytime soon. No, we will not take any more promissory notes. We will, however, demand that our schools and courts and political institutions, economic systems, police and legislatures act responsibly, equitably, and justly to us and our prosperity. To guarantee these premises, we promise to do the following, litigate, congregate, agitate, propagate, and instigate a continual revolutionary struggle. We should do more than overcome. We will more deliberately and meticulously and strategically utilize and maximize our voting, our economies, and our communities to foster not just change, but new realities. Thank you.